Well, hey, everybody, welcome to Be That Lawyer. I hope that you are well and having a wonderful day today. Whether you are in your car right now in traffic, just listening and trying to get some tips and ideas on how to be that lawyer, someone who's confident, organized, and a skilled rainmaker. Maybe you're walking your dog. I'm a big uh, podcast walk the dog guy. That's my jam. I, I take the dog for a walk. I throw on some headphones and and do that. And I always try to learn something new, try to figure out what um, is going to you know help me in my life, help me in my business, educate me on you know what's going on in the world. Um, and how you doing, Jeff? I'm doing well, Steve. How are you? Doing fine. Doing fine. Yeah. We were having some audio issues and I'm glad we figured them out. Uh, but I'm happy to have you on the show. I thought we had a really great conversation on a week or two ago and was super excited to get you on the show and um, and get get uh, get things rolling. And you've got the shortest quote of the show in the history of this show. It's three words other than maybe someone said uh, Nike's just do it. Uh, but yours is do it now. Yes. Yeah. Now. T -t Tell us about that. Why do it now? Well, that that actually came from one of my law school professors. Okay. Jerome Leitner. I was at Brooklyn Law School. He he taught trial advocacy. I took him for a couple of courses, um, but he was a terrific guy. He was a great mentor. Uh, and he told me about this saying that he adopt, adopted when, when he first started out in the working world. And it was uh, just do it. It was a, a little sign that he put above his door frame. So when he shut the door to his office, that's what he saw, this little sign above the, the door frame that said, do it now. And he did that because it's so easy as a lawyer to procrastinate. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no really like over your shoulder telling you what you got to do next. You got to make these decisions yourself. You have a, a client that you need to call back and you're like, ah, I'll do it later. I'll do it tomorrow. And he just said he put that above his door. And anytime he had something to do and he was thinking about not doing it, he would just look up and it says, do it now. He'd say, I just got to do it now. Yeah. And I'm putting together that lawyers and ADHD teenagers are not that different in the sense that my teenager, it's always, if he does it right away, it's like the best thing that's ever happened. And then it's like, yeah, I'll get to it or, you know, later, you know, whatever. And then I just know it's going to, those clothes are going to sit on the stairs for, you know, days yeah. or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, too funny. So, so Jeff, you're Jeff Kimmel, as you know, your your own name. You're Jeff Kimmel, managing partner of um, Salinger, Sack, Kimmel, and Bavaro. Bavaro. Um, and I'd love for you guys to share because the topic we're going to hit today is a really important one. It's really about how lawyers who move into management roles uh, need to kind of really think about their, you know, their the hat that they're going to wear. And in many cases, they're wearing 10, 15, 20 different hats. It rarely works out with that. And I want to, we'll get into the weeds on that, but give us a little background, um, uh, you know, leading into your current role as the managing partner of your firm. Okay. Yeah. I, I did not become the managing partner voluntarily or willingly. It, it was not something I aspired to do when I was in law school and said, I, I want to, you know, get a job one day and, and be the managing partner. I did not think that. I, I, I went to law school to become a trial lawyer. I did become a trial lawyer. I was in the DA's office first. I tried cases. And then I went into the civil world and I became a personal injury medical malpractice lawyer and I tried cases. And never did I think that I was going to become uh, the managing partner of the firm. You know, I, I just thought I was going to be a trial lawyer. Yeah. And you know, the circumstances where you want me to get into that, the circumstances that you can get it. into the circumstance. I'm wondering if that involves uh, handcuffs or a straitjacket, but okay, <laughs> we'll get, we'll figure it out. <laughs> well, uh, the managing partner, uh, when I was, when I was hired, uh, I was a young, I was a young guy and the two partners were Salinger and Sack and they're like my dad's age. So it was like going to work for my dad and my uncle. Yeah. And, and they were great guys. They had great reputations in the industry and they'd been stalwarts in, in, in the uh, New York personal injury world. And it was great. Uh, but as time went on, they got older, I got older and I became partner, but they kept getting older. I kept getting older and the managing partner, Bob Sack, passed away. Mm. And at that time, it was the four of us, Joe Bavaro, who's my partner now, Marvin and, and myself and, and Bob and Bob passed away. And so at that point, and, you know, the three of us, uh, Marvin, Joe, and myself, we're all trial lawyers. And, you know, that's what we did. And so when he passed away, we sort of just, you know, looked at each other and said, hmm, okay. And we had a bookkeeper, we had an accountant, and we just said, you know what? Those people will take care of the finances. They'll, they can, you know, manage that stuff. We'll just keep doing what we're doing. 
and we did that for about a year. Uh, and then, you know, it, it, I don't want to say exactly what happened, but the stuff hit the fan. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wait, we haven't paid taxes. What, what do you mean? Yeah. So, uh, things happened and, you know, I was by default nominated and elected to become the managing partner. I, I had a bit of a business background, which I hadn't utilized in, in 25 years, but the other two, uh, basically were incapable of, of managing their own finances, let alone the finances of the firm. Yeah. So by default, it was, it became my job. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, you know, I, I did ultimately embrace it. I'm, I'm now very happy that it happened. I'm sure like everything else that happened for a reason. And, um, you know, I, I, I've embraced the role and I, you know, it, it's what I do now, uh, every day and I love it. Yeah. And that, that sounds like a be that lawyer tipping point in the sense that, that not all tipping points happen by choice. Sometimes they happen, you know, by accident and we have to kind of roll with them. And, and that sort of then defines who we become or how we, you know, me being, I was in a plane crash when I was in my twenties. I met a coach when I was in my 40, in my thirties, um, things that, that happen that you don't realize are going to happen. And they, they, they change the course. So really, really cool there. Yeah. So what, I mean, I know working with tons of managing partners every day, every week, what a lot of their challenges are. What were some of the challenges that you found you were having entering into that role? Well, first understanding the business and, and how it was run. You know, I just took for granted that the managing partner dealt with all these financial issues and, and made these financial decisions. And I didn't know what the expenses of the firm really were. I didn't know what the payroll was. I didn't even know how I got paid. I just knew that the money ended up in my bank account. <laughs> I, I didn't really care much about everybody else. I'm yeah. like, oh. uh, so I knew nothing about the business of the firm, you know, insurance that we had, yeah. the rent that we paid, you know, all these things uh, I had no idea of. Also, you know, the, the money that gets dispersed uh, from us. That's, that's the biggest part of my job. Now we are a personal injury firm. So we get checks from insurance companies on settlements, but then that money has to be dispersed the right way. Yes. Yes. And, and, and we have referring attorneys that are entitled to a piece of the legal fee and everybody and ha has a different arrangement and every case have a, has a different set of characters and, and plaintiffs are promised certain money and we have to pay back liens and we have expenses and all. So it, it's actually, you know, this is a weekly thing I do with the checks that come in one week. When, when the, when the checks clear, I have to now disperse them the right way. Uh, so that's something that I, I just really had to learn how to do. I just, I, I never did it. I, I was looking at my, my partner's, um, paperwork and it was, you know, he just had a pen and paper and he's just doing mathematics, you know, yeah, like right, right. <laughs> dividing by three. So it was, it was interesting. I'm, I'm a little more advanced now. Uh, you know, I have a calculator. He, he yeah. didn't even use a calculator. Uh, so transition wise, you know, the, the, the business aspect of it was the first thing. Cause I, I never paid attention to it. Yeah. And then, and then were you prior to taking on that role, were you, you weren't just the trial attorney. Were you also, um, a rainmaker? Were you out trying to develop business and build relationships and all that as well? Yes. So that's, that's how I became partner. Uh, and the same thing for my, my partner, Joe Bavaro, uh, I'm, I'm, I was, I think, a pretty good trial lawyer. My partner's an excellent trial lawyer. Um, but we both network and we both have and, and had a book of business and, and we were bringing in business to the firm. And that's how we became partners, um, you know, because right. we, we had that income. <coughs> Excuse me. So, yeah, we both and, and, and my partner is, is a natural networker. He's, he's a great golfer. And, you know, he does those kinds of things. And, and yeah, so um, I was responsible for bringing in a lot of the work as well as doing the trials. Yeah. So you've got the, the business side, you've got the actual legal work side, you have the rainmaking side, and then there's people, right? Managing people, dealing with culture, dealing with marketing, dealing with technology. So this is when I when I think about the managing partners that I work with, and my, many of them are in my peer, peer advisory roundtable. So what's nice is that they get to share ideas, best practices, challenges, problems with each other. So they're not feeling like they're alone on an island trying to figure all this stuff out by themselves. Um, but 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 the things that come up on a regular basis, and most of it revolves around people and people problems. 
Absolutely. You know, the, the one thing uh, that was a big transition for me was dealing with the staff. You know, I, I was like an island unto myself when I was a trial lawyer. I, I worried about my cases and my clients and, and getting things done and being ready for trial. And now all of a sudden the staff was my responsibility and having to manage them and deal with them became my, my job. And that, that was, that was a learning experience. So it's not something I learned in, in law school. Right. And it's something that I take over. Yeah. And I think one of the most interesting things about <laughs> you and our conversation leading into kind of what, you know, the topic of the day is many of them of the managing partners, <clears throat> I mean, the majority of the managing partners out there are wearing, you know, a dozen, half a dozen to a dozen hats and they're practicing and they're managing and they're still out there making rain and trying to build business. And you've flipped a switch uh, where you've said, essentially, look, I want to run the business side of things. And you've taken a step back from practicing. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And that's, and that's something that most lawyers just, I don't know if it's, it's, it's in their persona, if it's in their um, DNA, if it's how they perceive themselves as, as, you know, how they're, you know, they're valued in society, that they're the trial lawyer, that's, that's their thing. And to take a step back and say, look, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm really going to focus on, on building the business and being the CEO of, or managing partner of this firm. That's a, not only a tough decision, a big decision. So I'm interested in hearing how you ultimately made that decision. Well, I, again, it was not voluntary. It was, it was <laughs> okay. Too. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I knew how important it was and it was, it's my, it was my firm, you know, and, and, and somebody had to run it. And so it became my, my responsibility to do it. I, I, I embraced it and I, I enjoy it because I developed my own system as my own way of managing my own way of, of handling the finances, my own way of, of dealing with, you know, the managing partner issues. Um, but yeah, I, I, I didn't plan on doing it and I didn't go through a training period. I didn't learn it, how to do it in law school. It was something that, um, you know, I, it was done out of necessity, but I saw an opportunity to run the business in a way that we were going to be more efficient, you know, make more money. And, you know, that, that having that uh, power and discretion and, you know, ability to change things up and, you know, view my whole world differently. I, I, I was always focused on my next trial and helping the next client. And now I was like, okay, now my focus is on the business. How am I going to help the business? How am I going to make the business grow? How am I going to make it more efficient? How am I going to make the people that work for me, you know, happy? How am I going to make a good culture within the firm? Those things. Well, was that, was that, I know you're saying, I know you're saying by necessity. Uh, however, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of managing partners that don't make that move that still, you know, hang on to clients. They hang on to trials and matters and things that they're doing. Um, but you've given that up. So, I mean, I guess I'm just looking at either an understanding of your mindset or your understanding. Did you have a sense of loss? Do you still have a sense of loss? Are you able to still talk shop with, with, with folks in the firm to kind of get your, your, your taste of it or whatever we might call that and, and staying, staying abreast of, of the law? It's interesting that you ask that because we've we we have that discussion often. Um, I'm still very involved in the cases in the sense that I'm involved with trial strategy, with just case management. Most of my day is spent answering questions by the attorneys who come into my office about what do I do next? You know, should we take this case? Uh, you know, how do I call this? You know, call this client? What do I what do I need to do? So I am spending most of my day. Uh, answering questions about what to do next on cases and how to handle issues on cases. Um, and then for the lawyers that are on trial, you know, we, we have a lot of discussions about trial strategy. And then as the case, you know, I, I go to court and sit in the courtroom and watch some of the trials uh, just because I want to help and, and be part of it. Also, I'll get involved in negotiating uh, the case as it's being tried. It's, it's difficult as a trial lawyer to try a case and, also try to settle it at the same time. I mean, I found that. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, for my partner who's trying our biggest cases, I say, just you try the case. I'll sit in the courtroom whenever they want to talk money. 
they can talk to me. You just worry about trying the case. You worry about the next witness you're going to call. You worry about the evidence that needs to go in. So as much as my responsibility is to the business end of things, I still am very involved in the trial work and the, the personal injury, the medical malpractice stuff that's going on. I, I don't have a caseload. Yeah. I'm not managing cases. I'm not right, talking right. To clients on a daily basis. I'm really yeah. not. I'm, I, I delegate all that. That was a skill. Uh, we can talk about that, that I, that I needed to learn. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a big one, man. That is, yeah. that is top of the list that the ability to delegate and, and to disconnect and, you know, people, and then the argument, listen to this argument and you tell me if this affected you. Um, Hey, I want you, Jeff, you're the lawyer that was referred to me. You're the lawyer that comes highly recommended. I want you. How are you then managing that expectation of the business that was coming in for you and being able to hand it off without losing it, uh, losing that business? Well, that, that's a great question. It's a, it's a real issue that came up a lot more in the beginning because I, I left clients when I became the partner, the managing partner. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but still to this day, <clears throat> people are referred, like you say, referred to me. You know, the, the referring attorneys say, call the firm, here's the number, but you have to talk to Jeff. You know, you must talk to Jeff. So how do I handle it? I'm, I'm honest with, with the people. I say, it's my firm. I'm going to be involved. But what I tell them is that we have a team of lawyers and staff working on your case. And they'll be handling most of the day-to-day -day stuff. But any major decision that needs to be made on your case, I will be involved with. And what I personally do is I give every client that I deal with, I give them my cell phone number. And I say, you can call me anytime. You can text me anytime here's my here's my number and they all appreciate that yeah. and nobody nobody abuses it it's it's a good it's a good practice it's very comforting when, when i give them my cell phone number so i i do stay involved but i i am upfront in telling them that there's a team of, of lawyers and staff who will be doing the day-to-day -day that will be working on your case but i'm always here and you could always talk to me yeah and there's an absolute disconnect for many lawyers on how to do that right i know you had to kind of figure it out but i'm you know, um, in the trenches listening to, to this, in this, this, the team approach is a very effective way to, you know, let them know, look, I, you know, like a team, I'm the coach, I'm the quarterback. I have this great team around me. You don't want me, you want the team and right. I'll still stay involved as from a strategic standpoint. And again, when you say, you know, they can reach you if they need and, and giving them that comfort, you're not going to lose the business to someone else because you're not trying the case when you have that approach. I think that's really, really wise, Jeff, that you, uh, that you take that approach. And I'm glad that you figured that out. Cause some, some lawyers just, you know, they don't, they don't do that and they just stay in the trenches right. because they haven't figured out that transition yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so just to, to add to that point, we, we, we have lawyers who come and go, you know, there's, there's some turnover and it's, it's, it's a thing when a lawyer leaves for whatever reason that the caseload for that lawyer gets, transition to another lawyer now for us the the firm and, and the lawyers and the team it's like okay the smith case that's not your team it's now going to be this team and you know we're done now to the client that is a, a monumental you know uh, event yeah and for sure this is, this is their case this is their only case it's a catastrophic event so you know making that transition and telling them that now you have a new lawyer we now have a whole new protocol about managing that and the communication that needs to go into it and the, the verbiage that we use when we inform the client that there's a, you know, a new team that's working or someone else is yeah. joining. The, it, it's, it's a very sensitive thing for clients to hear and you have to treat that with kid gloves. Give me, give me a sliver of that language. I'm just curious. I know it's, I don't, I hope it's not your secret sauce, but I think it's, it's important for lawyers to, to know similarly to how you transition the, the leads that you get coming in to your team also when you have to take over for someone else, what, what's kind of the right. one or two sentence language that you use to, to help people understand that they're going to be okay. Yeah. So we, we, we just had, we hired a new associate and we're giving her a bunch of cases. So we're taking them from one lawyer and transitioning to the next. And, and, you know, she's going to have a caseload. Uh, we're, we're shifting 20 cases to her over the next, you know, two months. So how does that, how do we do that? Well, we, we bring the client in or we set up a conference call. Ideally, we do this in person because it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. We basically say it's going from uh, from Jared's case to uh, Brooke's case. Right. So but we tell the client that, you know, Jared's you, 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 you love Jared. He's been your attorney, you know, for the last two years. 
Um, we now have someone else joining the team. Brooke is going to be on the team and she's going to handle more of the day-to-day stuff, but Jared is still going to be involved. You can always call Jared, but, but, but Brooke and her paralegal are going to be doing more day-to-day stuff. So you'll be hearing from them. And you, you, when you call, you'll probably be transferred to them. But if at any time you want to speak with Jared, he's, he's available. So we, we just, we bridge it in, in a way that they don't think it's that much of a, yeah. um, you know, a transition or it's, it's not a jarring event for them. And, and Jared's still there. It, it doesn't work that well when the lawyer has left the firm. Right. But right. This, this actually just happened last week. You know, we, we had a meeting about how we're going to handle it. And it's not just the lawyers, by the way, you know, everybody on the team has to know this is going on, including the receptionist. You know, you think, oh, the receptionist, she's not involved or he's not involved in anything. What's going to happen is the attorney's going to call, uh, the, the client's going to call, and the receptionist takes the call, and the receptionist doesn't know much about the cases or whatnot. And the client's going to say, Oh, it's Mr. Smith. I'm calling to talk to uh, Jared. And then the, the, uh, the receptionist's going to look at the computer and say, Oh, no, that case is Brooks now. I'll transfer you to Brooke. Well, and yeah, right, right. The problem right there. <laughs> that's how the client finds out that her case has been transferred to another lawyer then you failed. Yeah. As, no as doubt. So, you, you know, it's, it's, it's that sensitivity to the needs and the mental psyche of your clients that, that needs to be, you know, upfront and dealt with from the beginning. And it's got to encompass everybody within the firm who's going to be involved in that process. Yeah. And I'm assuming if, if the lawyer leaves the firm and is now not in contact with the clients at all, then the language has to shift to maybe again, back to the team, we're, we're up to speed on this. We know every aspect of the case and Brooke's going to be the one helping you, but let's meet and talk about it, whatever that might be. And, you know, again, that's, that's the, the hope that they're, that they follow suit. Yeah. It's, it's a lot harder when we say the attorney's no longer with us that, yeah. that for whatever reason, they're now, you know, pursuing other things and, you know, the client has to just accept that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a harder sell, but you know, that, that's the reality. Yeah. No, and then again, you got to roll with it and you got to, but you got to your point, you have to be prepared with some approach and language and way of handling it so that it's not uh, just a winging it type of situation where it could go south real fast. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I literally had a, 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 I called everybody into the conference room and said, okay, this is a big deal. We're transferring 20 cases from Jared to, to Brooke. Everybody's going to know what's going on. Yeah. You know, because if there's one breakdown, that's what, that's what's going to, get to the client, you know, we got, yeah. it's got to be a smooth process with protocols. And that's what I'm trying to install and still, and that's what, as managing partner, that's what I'm trying to do is be consistent and give them guidance and guidelines about how to handle situations. So there's uniformity. It, it does it ever, does it always work? No. Uh, but, but those, something like that needs, you know, clarity and protocol and uniformity. Yeah. You know, the, going back a few minutes uh, to something you said about, about not, not really working directly with, with, um, you know, with in, in, you know, having a caseload, but still mentoring, still being involved in the cases. There's a quote I came up with not that long ago. Um, uh, don't do what you love to do, do what you love to do for others. And so what that, you know, what, what I'm saying there is like, you know, you may love being a trial lawyer. However, how much more effective could you be teaching people in your firm? how to be an effective trial lawyer and, and getting your juice through that versus being in the courtroom. It doesn't work for everybody, but I know like I, I love sales. I love selling. I love the creativity of it. I love marketing. I love all that. I'll tell you what I really love. I love working with lawyers on that and watching them perform and watching them excel and build big books and million dollar books and all that. So I think that's, that's just something I really want to just share that I appreciate that you're doing and I think I don't know if you have, have you saw have you sort of seen it that way or thought about it from that angle? Oh yeah, for sure. And and what what I try and do when when anyone comes into my office with a question, uh, especially if it's a staff person, not a lawyer, mm-hmm. um, I don't I try not to just answer the question to get them out of my office. I I really try to give them perspective into how this question fits in to the case. And where it fits into the case and how it's relevant to the case, so so they understand the importance of it and and how it affects the client and 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 stuff like that. And it's not just for lawyers; it's for the staff. Because I, I feel like if the staff knows 
how important, you know, a specific thing is and, and, and why it's going on. And, you know, I, I'll give you an example. So if someone comes in and says, oh, there's a, there's a, we call them IMEs. It's a physical, it's a physical that's done by the other side. The, the insurance company gets to examine the client. Um, of course, they hire doctors that say that the person's not injured and all that stuff. Um, and they come in and testify at the trial that the injury is not as bad as you think. But when someone comes in, just last week I had um, a, a paralegal come in and say, oh, you know, we're just going to adjourn the, uh, the, the exam because of whatever reason. I said, you know, we really shouldn't because it, it, we, we really should insist on having it go forward because this is important and we want to get it done. We don't want to delay the case. I said, but do you understand what's going on? And I, I explained to her how the defense physical fits into the case and, and why it's important and sort of what I just told you what it means and and how it's used to trial because i feel like when someone has the perspective of how their task their specific task which if they don't try cases they don't know really how it fits in but if they have that perspective of, of what that task means to the big picture i feel they're going to be a, a better employee and they're going to be um you know more sympathetic to the client and what the client's going through yeah yeah right on so listen as we as we kind of wrap up we've got a few minutes left any other tips for Build it, running, building, scaling a firm, managing partners that are listening that maybe need to take a hat off. You know, they're wearing too many hats still and need to take some off. Any anything that lessons you've learned that that you'd like to just uh, share? Sure. Well, the 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 latest for us when you talk about scaling, we of course are always we're always looking to make more money and to grow. But the way we've decided now to grow, and COVID actually affected this a lot, um, is to shrink and 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 not grow in the sense that instead of just taking and 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 we've i could go through years ago we had certain experiences hiring people taking over their practice and having them join the firm and merge with our firm and these kinds of things what we've now done since covid is we've pared down and what and 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 have half the staff we had before covid um but we're making more money because we decided that we're going to be more selective in the cases that we take so we can make more money from the cases that we take and, and we can focus on those cases and, you know, and maximize those cases. It's much easier in my world to take a $500,000 case and make it a $750,000 case than it is to take a $5,000 case and make it a $10,000 case. Yeah, it just is because with the way the insurance companies and adjusters deal with it, you're, you're dealing with different levels within the insurance company, and so we've just made a very concerted effort, and I'm I'm behind it. I'm I'm, I'm really focusing on on rejecting cases now. Yeah, and 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 there was this big fear the the older guys that that when I when I first started who were managing the firm who were the you know Marvin and Bob, they would take everything you know because they didn't yeah. want to risk. Um, you know, a, a referring attorney being unhappy that that we didn't take their case and maybe, oh, for the next case, they'll go somewhere else. And I said, and, and recently or in the last few years, I, I said, you know, th the opposite is true. I think if we say no to the referring attorney, they're going to respect us for it. And they're going to say, oh, geez, I'm, I got to get a better case. So those guys will take it because they only take the better cases. Yeah. And, 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 you know, that's just my philosophy. So my part, my current partner now still has some of those fears. He's like, Oh, the guy refers a lot of cases. We, we really should just take this case too. And I say, no, no, they're going to respect us more for it. So as far as scaling, we've taken on less cases, but our bottom line has gone up. Yeah. That's really, really smart. I think a lot of people figured out different ways to, make more money and scale down staff and, and technology, whatever it might be in COVID. And, um, you know, uh, that, that's a, that's a huge, a huge, you know, boost for, you know, and, and less, less people to manage. So then you can get things under control and then decide how to scale back up if you want. So, yeah. Yeah. Really, really sure. cool. So listen, we've got, um, normally when we do a game changing book or a game changing podcast, Jeff, um, it's, it's something like think and grow rich, which I think is the one you recommended. And then I said, you know what, you know, Jeff, you're working with your wife, you're writing books and, uh, let's talk about your book. What lawyers don't know, uh, starting a business and, st and, and start, start, start a business and start loving life. I just destroyed the title. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> you can, you can then repeat the title and talk a little bit about this book that 
know, yeah. I think that's the, that's really the goal for attorneys is, you know, how do we run an effective business and not get buried by it? Right. Yeah. S- continue to enjoy life too. And that's, that's a real challenge. So I'm hoping there's a lot of good stuff in that book, uh, lessons you've learned that you're sharing. Yes. Yes. It's a ha- how, what lawyers don't know how to run a business and start loving life. And a, a, a lot of it was, was directed towards law students and young lawyers um, because I know when I became managing partner and learned all these things, what, what kept going through my mind is like, I didn't learn any of this in law school. Yeah. There was not one course in law school that had to do with business, like real business. I mean, I, I, we, I had accounting or whatever, but it was just the law of accounting. It wasn't how to, you know, read a profit and loss statement or, 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 or a balance sheet. It had nothing to do with business. So I was like, how could people go to law school? And then a, a lot of people look to leave law school and hang a shingle. Maybe not so much these days as, as in the past, but how do you hang a shingle without knowing anything about business? So the book was written to help people. Cause I, I learned so much about the business of law when I you know, became the managing partner and just saw what was going on and, and how to fix things, you know, one at a time. So I took that knowledge and it was during COVID uh, where, where we didn't have much to do, my wife and I, and we were home, you know, for months, whatever. Yeah. And I, and I had been now the managing partner for say five years. And I said, you know, I'm going to write all this stuff down. This is, this is really good for, for young lawyers to know that, that if they want to start their own business, they got to have some basic understanding of business networking, things you already mentioned. And so I did that. And my wife happens to be um, a life coach. She's also an author. She wrote a book about her philosophy, which is Start Loving Life. That's why that's how we get the title. But I started writing the book and I was going chapter by chapter um, and I would show her, I, I, we would talk about it and she's like, okay, that's good. But you also need the mindset. You have to have the mindset about how to network and, and how to love yourself and be confident with yourself and have good self-esteem before you can convince anyone else to give you work and, you know, all these things. Yeah. And then I was like, you know, why don't you write the book? <laughs> but, but, but then what, so we decided that for each chapter, I wrote the chapter and then she wrote her version of the chapter. Yeah. So me and her, me and her, me. And okay. Her. Okay. But, but essentially it just is the basics of what you need to know to, to run a business, you know, what, what's important, uh, you know, networking, marketing. Um, I, I go into, you know, profit loss statement a little bit. I go into balance sheets a little bit. I don't yeah, want to skin yeah. anybody. Um, but, you know, you, you have to know these kinds of things. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's very helpful, to, even if you don't want to be, and I tell this to young lawyers all the time, even if you don't want to be the boss, it's so important for you as a young lawyer to understand that the firm you're working at is also a business. Yeah. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate as managing partner when my attorneys come to me and they make it clear that they do understand this is a business. And they say, yeah. oh, I know this is a very important referring attorney, so I wanted to come and talk to you about this. Yeah. And, and, and or, or, you know, I think we should have this reviewed by an expert, but that expert's going to be $10,000, so I want to make sure it's okay before I spend that money. Like, so when they, when they know that there are expenses and that, you know, the payroll that they get every week doesn't just exist. Yeah, you know, yeah. The account, they, actually, I, they actually see a little bit how the sausage is made, right? Right, right. I, I, I got to put money in that account. And so where's that money coming from? It's from these cases that we're settling, you know, and, and yeah. a lot of people just have no idea that we just don't have all the money that, that they're going to get their paycheck every week. Now, thank God we, we, we haven't missed a paycheck and I don't yeah. anticipate we will miss a paycheck, but you know, that payroll account, it's, it's got to stay funded. And, and the, 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 the employees that understand this as a business and understand at least a little bit about how that business works, I appreciate them, you know, and I'm yeah. the one that makes decisions about raises and bonuses at the end of the year. So, you know, for, for any lawyer in any field, my advice always to them is, you know, it's great that you're going to be a lawyer. It's good stuff. You're, you're doing what you want to do, but understand the business yeah. And, 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 and make it clear to your bosses that, you know, a little bit about what they're feeling and what they're experiencing, because it'll help you in the long run for sure. Yeah. And you're preaching to the choir with me. I mean, everything I'm, I'm working on is stuff that was not taught in law school. So I'm, I'm always about trying to help lawyers to figure all that stuff out and in the business side as well. Um, Hey Jeff, thanks so much, man. This was great. Um, as we wrap up today, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, of course, Get Visible, helping people get their digital and their marketing in line. 
We've got overture.law, which you might be interested in, Jeff. That's uh, how to ethically fee share nationally. Um, mm -hmm. They've spent a lot of time and energy creating a platform that automatically takes care of the business side of the fee sharing process. And of course, Get Staffed Up, which is wonderful. Uh, I use them uh, every single day. Had a great meeting with my marketing guy, Sergio, today. Handles all of my marketing full time, about half or less than half of what I would pay for someone uh, to do that for me. And I don't have to deal with insurance or any of that stuff. So check out Get Staffed Up, everybody. Thanks again, Jeff, man. I appreciate this. I appreciate sharing your wisdom. Um, again, this is the kind of information that a lot of lawyers don't have and need. And I just want to you know, tell you again how much I, uh, I enjoyed the conversation and, and your ability to share um, your wisdom. Thanks so much, Steve. I had a great time. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And for you guys listening again, driving in your car, walking your dog, whatever you're doing, um, you know, this, these are, these are things that, that may not impact you necessarily today, but they may impact you in the future. And so really take heed and, 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 and become a student of the game, the game of law, the business of law, and it'll help you to be that lawyer, someone who's confident, organized and a skilled rainmaker. Do you like how I threw that in there, Jeff? Not too bad, <laughs> right? I always work my way right into it at the end. And, uh, listen, everybody take care, be safe, be well.